This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 22. Louise to Philippe. I am not pleased with you. If you did not cry over Racine's Berenice, and feel it to be the most terrible of tragedies, there is no kinship in our souls. We shall never get on together, and had better break off at once. Let us meet no more. Forget me, for if I do not have a satisfactory reply, I shall forget you. You will become Monsieur le Baron de Mecumer for me, or rather you will cease to be at all. Yesterday, at Madame d'Espard's, you had a self-satisfied air which disgusted me. No doubt, apparently, about your conquest. In sober earnest, your self-possession alarms me. Not a trace in you of the humble slave of your first letter. Far from betraying the absent-mindedness of a lover, you polished epigrams. This is not the attitude of a true believer, always prostrate before his divinity." If you do not feel me to be the very breath of your life, a being nobler than other women, and to be judged by other standards, then I must be less than a woman in your sight. You have roused in me a spirit of mistrust, Philippe, and its angry mutterings have drowned the accents of tenderness. When I look back upon what has passed between us, I feel in truth that I have a right to be suspicious. For no, Prime Minister of all the Spains, that I have reflected much on the defenceless condition of our sex." My innocence has held a torch, and my fingers are not burnt. Let me repeat to you, then, what my youthful experience taught me. In all other matters, duplicity, faithlessness, and broken pledges are brought to book and punished, but not so with love, which is at once the victim, the accuser, the counsel, judge, and executioner. The cruelest treachery, the most heartless crimes, are those which remain forever concealed, with two hearts alone for witness. How, indeed, should the victim proclaim them without injury to herself? Love, therefore, has its own code, its own penal system, with which the world has no concern. Now, for my part, I have resolved never to pardon a serious misdemeanor, and in love, pray, what is not serious? Yesterday you had all the air of a man successful in his suit, you would be wrong to doubt it, and yet, if this assurance robbed you of the charming simplicity which sprang from uncertainty, I should blame you severely. I would have you neither bashful nor self-complacent. I would not have you in terror of losing my affection. That would be an insult. But neither would I have you wear your love lightly as a thing of course. Never should your heart be freer than mine. If you know nothing of the torture that a single stab of doubt brings to the soul, tremble lest I give you a lesson." In a single glance I confided my heart to you, and you read the meaning. The purest feelings that ever took root in a young girl's breast are yours. The thought and meditation of which I have told you served only to enrich the mind, but if ever the wounded heart turns to the brain for counsel, be sure the young girl would show some kinship with the demon of knowledge and of daring. I swear to you, Philippe, if you love me— as I believe you do, and if I have reason to suspect the least falling off in the fear, obedience, and respect which you have hitherto professed, if the pure flame of passion which first kindled the fire of my heart should seem to me any day to burn less vividly, you need fear no reproaches. I would not weary you with letters bearing any trace of weakness, pride, or anger, nor even with one of warning like this. But if I spoke no words, Philippe, my face would tell you that death was near." and yet I should not die till I had branded you with my infamy, and sown eternal sorrow in your heart. You would see the girl you loved dishonoured and lost in this world, and know her doomed to everlasting suffering in the next. Do not, therefore, I implore you, give me cause to envy the old happy Louise, the object of your pure worship, whose heart expanded in the sunshine of happiness, since, in the words of Dante, she possessed, Senza brama, sicura ricchezza. I have searched the inferno through to find the most terrible punishment, some torture of the mind to which I might link the vengeance of God. Yesterday, as I watched you, 
doubt went through me like a sharp, cold dagger's point. Do you know what that means? I mistrusted you, and the pang was so terrible I could not endure it longer. If my service be too hard, leave it, I would not keep you. Do I need any proof of your cleverness? Keep for me the flowers of your wit. Show to others no fine surface to call forth flattery, compliments, or praise. Come to me laden with hatred or scorn, the butt of your calumny. Come to me with the news that women flout you and ignore you, and not one loves you. Then, ah, then you will know the treasures of Louise's heart and love. We are only rich when our wealth is buried so deep that all the world might trample it under foot, unknowing. If you were handsome, I don't suppose I should have looked at you twice, or discovered one of the thousand reasons out of which my love sprang. True, we know no more of these reasons than we know why it is the sun makes the flowers to bloom and ripens the fruit. Yet I could tell you of one reason very dear to me. The character, expression, and individuality that ennoble your face are a sealed book to all but me. Mine is the power which transforms you into the most lovable of men, and that is why I would keep your mental gifts also for myself. To others they should be as meaningless as your eyes, the charm of your mouth and features. Let it be mine alone to kindle the beacon of your intelligence, as I bring the love-light into your eyes. I would have you the Spanish grandee of old days, cold, ungracious, haughty, a monument to be gazed at from afar, like the ruins of some barbaric power, which no one ventures to explore. Now you have nothing better to do than to open up pleasant promenades for the public, and show yourself of a Parisian affability. Is my ideal portrait, then, forgotten? Your excessive cheerfulness was redolent of your love. Had it not been for a restraining glance from me, you would have proclaimed to the most sharp-sighted, keen-witted, and unsparing of Paris salons that your inspiration was drawn from Armand Louise Marie de Chaillot. I believe in your greatness too much to think for a moment that your love is ruled by policy. But if you did not show a childlike simplicity when with me, I could only pity you. Spite of this first fault, you are still deeply admired by Louise de Chaillot. End of letter 22. Read by Kara Schallenberg on May 4th, 2007, in Oceanside, California.